Good evening, my friends. I am Miss Casey from the Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library System. I am the Youth Services Librarian, so your librarian when you come to the main library. We are coming to you live through Zoom this month, February, for a wonderful Science Night program put on by the Bag Lab or FSU's Mag Lab, and we are going to be talking about magnets tonight. So for the experiment later, you want just a refrigerator magnet and a few um, paper clips. So you'll have that ready later. So I will say without further ado, Miss Yulia, it's all yours. Thank you, Miss Casey. And I am super excited to welcome everyone to Science Night tonight. Um, Next to Ms. Casey, we also have our wonderful chat master, Carlos Villa, who is with us every science night. And we have a special guest today to talk to us about superconductors and answer your questions. And that's Ernesto Bosque, also from the Magnet Lab. So let's jump right into this science night about magnets, which is, as you might be able to tell at the Mag Lab, one of the favorite things of us to look into. But before we get going, uh, we have our first poll session. We just want to make sure that everybody is um, on board and can follow us and can interact. So we have a poll session. We would like to see if you can hear us okay. Did you find the chat box? The chat box, depending on your device, is uh, in the utility bar. Um, sometimes you have to click on the three dots um, that say more to find the chat box. Um, we would also like to know how old you are, just so that we have an idea who we're interacting with. That's uh, in, uh, in the virtual world, it's not so easy to know. So we just want to know what your age uh, group is. And also, we would like to know from where you're joining us. All right, I see the votes flying in on our end. We have about half of you voting. So uh, please keep voting. And um, I'll uh, repeat one thing that I said before we started. Um, as Casey mentioned, we need um, paper clips and a fridge magnet. And since you're all joining us from an electronic device, just make sure you don't get your fridge magnet or other magnet too close to your devices. Um, so let's be careful with that. All right, um, I say I'll close the poll here. Um, and most of us can hear us okay. So one person can't hear us. Maybe you need to turn your volume up. Um, to be able to do that, everyone found a chat box. That's awesome. And in terms of who's out there, um, we have six to seven year old, eight and nine, four people, 10 or 11, and uh, three between four and 18. Awesome. Most of you are from the Tallahassee area. Uh, we have one outside of Florida and one side out of the Big Bend. We're super excited to have you all here. So um, welcome everyone. And um, let's get going. All right, let's try that chat box right away. Um, I'd like to explore with you what a magnet is. Um, any ideas? What is a magnet? Where, we, where do we find magnets in our daily life? What is maybe special about magnets? What can magnets do? And also, are there different types of magnets? So um, we would like to see what you all associate with magnets. Any ideas, just type it in the chat box and we will be excited to hear what you guys have to say. Carlos. Yeah, the answers are starting to come in. Um, they say that magnets are found in rocks or stones. It's a force that pulls and pushes, has north and south ends. They repel if it's a north and north. They, they've got this down. Good, all right, that's a really good start. So let's explore all of that in a little bit more detail. So we, we've heard about fridge magnets. Uh, we've heard about different ends of the magnets. Um, and I just wanna throw out there a couple of fancy words, which is that a magnet is a material or an object that has a magnetic field. And I wanna look into what a magnetic field is with you guys a little bit more. Um, it's, it's invisible, and we also heard about attraction. So let's check this out a little bit more. What is a magnetic field? And for that, I brought a video for you guys because it's a little hard to show this over Zoom. So let's check this out. Um, as my friend here takes a magnet and puts it on this device, which has some metal shavings in it. So um, 
let's check out what is happening there. Um, you can see here in, um, in this uh, device um, that the magnet had quite the effect on the, on the material because the magnetic field was interacting with those shavings in the water. And as we heard from some of you, there's different ends to the magnet. And we also wanna look into that a little bit more. So um, we saw there's different ends and we saw that, you know, there's a magnetic field and that it's invisible. And, you know, us being engineers and scientists, what we do if we can't see something with the eye, we build ourselves a device that can show us what's going on. So uh, this device, in a sense, is my detector to show you guys the invisible magnetic field. And all these shavings are aligning with something that we call magnetic field lines to make the magnetic field of this magnet visible. Now, Julia, can I ask you a question here? Absolutely. Is it, is it really important what kind of metal shavings there are in that device? Um, to some extent it is. Um, so some, some would react different than others. So yes, and we'll be talking about uh, materials and those um, more further on as well. Nice. All right. So about the magnetic field, I brought you another device. And actually I have that one here as well because this, it's so hard to see this over the Zoom um, as we interact with this um, magnet and, uh, um, and this um, also this detection system in a sense that interacts with this um, magnetic field. We have another video for you guys to check out the magnetic field and what fancy things it does to those metal shavings in the liquid. So as my friend here is putting the magnet closer to those shavings, um, I'd like to ask you to put in the chat box what you observe inside the tube. So let's type in a couple of things that you see and what you think is happening and, and why we see the structures that we see there. Any ideas? Some of my favorite words are coming in already. They've said porcupine. Um, oh, okay. Electromagnetic pull. They say that it's moving with the magnet. That is that is really great answers. I do love the porcupine because that really uh, aligns with the magnetic field idea. Mm -hmm. Because and, um, and we just got a hedgehog typed in too. So we got a porcupine and a hedgehog, and I can't argue with either one. They're both right. I love those ideas, and I really love that device and the porcupine and, and the hedgehog idea, because in the flat detection system that I show you, it really looked like the magnetic field was just in the plane. But with the test tube, you can really see that it's like a 3D structure. So it's not only limited to one plane, but it you know reaches out into all directions. And Yulia, so, someone has just referred to it as Sonic the Hedgehog. So I love the pop culture reference. Nice job. You guys are awesome out there. That is exciting. So that brings us to our next poll. Let's see what you guys uh, think. Can humans see a magnetic field? And can you make a magnetic field visible? So let's launch the next poll and let's see what you guys think. Can we see a magnetic field? Or can you make a magnetic field visible? All right, so for only one person voted, let's, let's try this. Can we see a magnetic field? All well, they're right. coming in, the votes are coming in fast and furious now. And okay. it looks like number one is almost completely in agreement, but we got a little bit of a disagreement on number two. So I'll let you, um, we'll give a couple more seconds so they can all, everybody can vote, um, but I'll let you, broadcast the results. All right, um, let's end the poll here and we'll share the results. So can you see a magnetic field? No, we said a magnetic field is invisible and can we make it visible? So there is yes and no answers. And I must say that I can agree with both of the answers because yeah, we can make it visible, but it's really a di indirect proof of the magnetic field. So I can see why some would think one way and one the other, because it's, it's probably an answer like yes, but, or no, but. So um, there we go. All right. 
Now, this is really something that I wanted Carlos to uh, comment on because in our poll question, we said, can humans see a magnetic field? But I can only suspect that Carlos would like to comment <laughs> on this one. I, I recognize those pictures. Those are out of my presentation. And um, th there's something that is unfortunately horribly boring about humans. And that is the fact that we cannot see, feel, taste, detect um, magnetic or electromagnetic fields. Um, we're very boring in that sense where magnetic fields aren't something that we can interact with. However, there are animals in nature that can interact with, hum with uh, magnetic fields. Uh, you can see the geese flying there in the middle of that of those three pictures and of course a lot of birds fly south for the winter and they can't read a compass so the only way they know how to fly south is by detecting earth's magnetic field and knowing what direction to go in using earth's magnetic fields so a lot of birds can detect magnetic fields um, same with sea turtles sea turtles um, remember where they are born so when they're born, they crawl out of the sand, they go into the oceans and they swim all over the oceans. And when it's time for the female sea turtle to lay her eggs, she returns to the same beach she was born on and not just like the same beach in general. She goes to nearly the exact same spot where she was born. I think scientists says within 20 to 30 feet of where they were born. So very precise where they can re return to. And I have the hammerhead shark up here because sharks can detect magnetic fields too, particularly the hammerhead shark. And that's why they've got that large and large forehead. Um, they've got sensitive um, organs on the very tip of that and large nose that can detect magnetic fields. So when they're swimming in murky water, they don't necessarily need to see the fish swimming around. The little secret here is that all living things give off a slight magnetic field. And these sharks here can actually detect the magnetic fields that living things give away. And the shark can pounce and hunt without necessarily needing to see their prey. And that's a scary thought, um, but that's what sharks can do. They've got that ability, so. Awesome, Carlos, thank you for this. All right, when we talked about magnets in the beginning, some of you were talking about magnetic poles. And I think this is probably the standard magnet that most of us have in mind when we think about, um, when we think about a permanent magnet. Um, we call these two ends poles. And um, one of them is the North Pole. And look, oh, Carlos has one too. The other one is called a South Pole. And um, again, I wanna show you guys what happens when we put, uh, two such magnets on our magnetic field detector. So right here, you can see that we put um, two of them right next to each other and we put the different poles, so the um, opposite poles right next to each other. So um, what is going on here is as we set with the magnetic field, you know, we have these magnetic fields that go from the north to the south pole. And, you know, when we bring um, a north and a south pole together, uh, they want to um, attract each other. If you check out this region, you can see how the magnetic fields interact and, um, and how it would pull those magnets together. But, you know, since we're experimentalists, we, we wouldn't just take my word for it, but we don't, would also uh, want to try this out. So let's check this out. And whoop, there it went. So they, they actually attract one another. And I think we have, uh, we have all tried this out. But what now happens if we bring uh, two like poles together and feel free to type in the chat box what you all think is going to happen. All right, let's put them uh, let's put them there, and we already see that there's something different going on. Instead of those connecting field lines that we saw earlier on, there's this void or empty area here. Um, so uh, let's have a look um, what we learn here. So if we look how the field lines are, and what happens in this region is that they actually push away from one another, and um, of course, we tried that out for you guys as well. So what is happening here as we bring the two together? And uh, I really love that whenever it happens. It's, you know, you're trying 
to push the two together and there's this invisible force that you're you're trying to counteract and bring them together and if you actually let go of one of the two magnets it will just flip around um, the magnet as we saw in the video so um, since one of the two magnets the one on the left side is not secured it just flips around and moves to um to the uh, to the attraction side again. I'm that's... such a nerd. I'm watching this video and I'm cheering like, yes, they attracted. <laughs> All right. Uh, I love that, Carlos. All right. So let's check this out. Let's see um, what you all remember. Like, what are the ends of a permanent magnet called? Is the first question. And the second one is, like poles do what? They attract or they repel. All right, so for the ends of a permanent magnet, we have terminals, poles, and tails. And um, so far we have the poles in the lead and like poles to what? Um, I'm waiting for a couple more answers. Already more than 10 of you have replied. Okay, let's end this poll and I'll share the results with you. So yes, the ends of a permanent magnet are called poles and like poles do what i'll show it to you guys again if i can they are repelling so we got that straight awesome all right now Julia, um, before you go on i've got a question for you for you specifically because a lot of people forget that you are a um you're not just the host you're one of the mag labs top scientists so i've got a question for you and, uh, and Dr. Bosky, you can feel free to um, jump into my question is this, um, what's more important, the physical magnet or the magnetic field? Wow, okay, that's an interesting one. I think the, the um, since one is not really, I mean, the field wouldn't be there without the magnet. Um, I would say um, it, it probably is, I mean, in terms of important to have the field, you would have to have the magnet. So if you, if you make me choose, I would say the magnet is more important to have both there. However, one doesn't really exist without the other. So um, yeah, and, sure. and in terms of being a scientist, um, you know, I mean, we love our magnets, but we do um, most of our research with the actual field. So um, yeah, there's also something to be said for that, Ernesto. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna back you up and say if a tree falls in the woods, you still need the tree. So I'm gonna say that the magnet itself is pretty important. Um, and as a magnet designer, I tend to work with the actual making of the magnet. So I'll say the magnet's pretty important to generate the field. Yeah. It was one of these weird moments when they asked me a question and I was like, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I was completely stumped. And this came from a first grader and I was like, mm. so, so I, I'm glad I'm able to ask two of the scientists and, and get a, a better response than what I could supply because I was completely, first of all, um, floored that this question came from a first grader and then completely stumped by giving them an answer. So, so thank you. Sure thing. So and that brings us to um, to materials. Now I don't want to go into the periodic table of elements a whole lot, um, but it basically gives an overview of all the building blocks, all the elements that the world around us is made of. And um, this version here that uh, Carlos has provided to us is already nicely colored. So it has um, has different groups. We have like the red, orange, yellow, greenish, and uh, and pink at the bottom. And, and actually, um, all uh, like um, all of these groups are um, are actually metals. But not all of them, uh, contrary to popular belief, are magnetic to to start with. Um, actually, it's a very very small subset that um, that is magnetic from the get go. So. Um, that brings us to how do um, magnets and these materials actually work? And uh, the workhorses to make those work are electrons. Um, and to understand that, we have to zoom into um, the building blocks of matter around us, atoms. I have a cartoon here which shows um, the nucleus. 
which we're not going to engage with a whole lot here. And it also gives a cartoon of where the electrons live around um, the, uh, the atoms. And um, it's really important that to realize that the electrons are really what is responsible for the magnetic field. And the way I like to think about this is that the electrons have something that um, has a fancy term that's called magnetic moment. Um, and I like to think about that as electrons really being uh, little bar magnets of themselves. So we can get pretty far in this by thinking about each electron being a little bar magnet of itself. And materials have lots of electrons and depending on what materials uh, they are, two of those um, bar magnets pair up together and then they don't much participate in whatever uh, magnetism is going on. However, if there is um, electrons left over by themselves, they can participate and, and add their little bar magnetism to the properties of the material. So if we have a material where all of these bar magnets are arranged randomly with respect to one another, there's not much going on because overall, they just cancel each other out. However, if we can manage, and this is important to remember now because we'll need that for our hands-on experiment, if we can manage to line up all these um, little bar magnets in the same direction, we can make a bigger magnet from that and that will have a magnetic field around it just like this bar magnet. So if we can uh, align all our electrons to work in the same direction, we produce a magnetic field. And um, just remember that for the hands-on experiment. Moving on, I also wanted to ask if you think that there are human-made magnets, and I'm already giving it away a little bit in the pictures, um, so type in the chat box if you think there are human-made magnets and um, what is special about them and what is the big difference between these permanent magnets and the human-made magnets. Well, they're all typing in the answers right now and I'm just going to read them to you as best I can. It's yes, yes, yes. Uh, all and there right. are multiple exclamation marks on that first one. Um, so I just wanted to try and give as much emphasis as I could. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, we have magnets that are uh, set up in, uh, in hospitals for MRIs or, you know, other, other scans. Then we have electromagnets, junkyard magnets. Um, and also I, uh, I smuggled in one of our magnets from the mag lab, actually. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, so there's different types of magnets. We have permanent magnets like uh, refrigerator magnets, toy magnets, calendar magnets, and then there's the temporary ones like staples, paper clips, the car door, screws, nails, or electromagnets. So um, we'll talk about the electromagnets a little bit more, but first I wanted to ask, what is a big difference between permanent and temporary magnets? And a fridge magnet is, so what is a big difference between permanent and temporary magnets? Um, so Yulia, if all these answers are coming in, um, one of the responses in the chat box I wanna bring up to you because you asked if they're human made magnets and somebody responded that yes, but they are much bigger. Is that always true? So I would argue that that is not always true because for example, our planet that we are sitting on has a earth magnetic field around it. And um, that's a pretty, pretty big magnet. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but the, I'm sorry. They said that the human made magnets are bigger. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm sorry, Yulia, I, I completely get you. No problem. <laughs> so yeah, so um, Though I must say that um, it depends a little bit on if you think of physical size, I would say our planet Earth is pretty huge. If you think about magnetic field strength, um, the human made magnets are, uh, are actually pretty strong. Like if you, for example, compare a fridge magnet, um, it is um, much, much less strong than a junkyard magnet which in turn is very, very much less strong than a mag the magnets that we have um, at the Magma Lab to do our research. All right, let's end this poll. Um, 
and see what we got. And most of you say that permanent magnets are always magnetic while temporary magnets can be turned off. And that is right. And also a fridge magnet is a permanent magnet. That is right too. All right, let's move on. Electromagnets, we already talked about electrons and them being really important in magnetism. And that is also true, um, not too surprising for our electromagnets. So you see here a beautiful graphic where we have a wire. And if you have a flow of current or electrons that all go the same way as we have with a, a direct current or a, a DC, a steady current, then that creates a magnetic field around the wire. And that is indicated here with the yellow circles. And if we think about that in, um, in, in more detail, you will have this um, even though it's maybe not very strong, but you know, for every current, for every electron flowing, you have a little bit of magnetic field around the wire. And you can imagine now if you coil this wire up, which is what is happening in this graphic, you are starting to turn the direction of the magnetic field around the wire. And you can actually manage to concentrate your magnetic field at uh, the center of this wire. Carlos. I've got a question, ready? Mm -hmm. They're asking, do we know what makes one magnet stronger than another? Yes, we do. We do know a bunch about that. So um, our magnet designers uh, study different properties of magnets. So the human made magnets, um, there's, a, there's a lot of research into materials and you know how much, um, current and how much um, force uh, a certain material can withstand. So there are certain materials that are um, more conducive to withstanding the forces that are within a magnet, but also to carry the current and hence the magnetic field um, that, um, that the magnet will put out. So um, it actually is a whole field of science and, and I'm sure um, Ernesto will, uh, will want to say something about that too, is you know, there's a whole field of science that looks into the materials for magnets and that studies exactly that question. What makes one material more suitable to make a high field magnet than another? Yeah, so, so piggybacking off of what you just said, Yulia, the, um, the graphic here is, is kind of perfect for for the electromagnetic or, or for the electromagnet, um, that, that red arrow that you see that goes along the wire, if you make that current, that's electricity running through that wire, if you can get that electricity, that current to higher and higher values, you're gonna make a stronger and stronger magnet. Um, then it becomes a, a mechanical engineering challenge to make sure that that magnet doesn't explode it. you do. Um, but yeah, so at least with the man-made magnets, we can certainly deliver quite a big punch with very, very small magnets. Thank you. And uh, as you two are answering that question, another question came in, and that is, does the size of the magnet affect the pull? Let me say, does the size of the magnet affect the field? Well, let me take a stab at this one. Okay. So um, yet again, the uh, picture that Yulia has on the screen here is, is, is exceptional. If you go to the third one, the coil there, you see how those magnetic field lines that are going around each wire, right? But it's one wire that's coiled. All of those field lines will actually superimpose on each other and add, okay? So if you think about it, if you have a really, really, really long coil, all of those field lines are, are adding the same direction. So you actually get a more perfect magnet in the middle. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a really nice uniformity. So size does matter to some aspects of the, of the magnetism. And then if you were to crunch these coils really, really tightly together, it's the same principle of superposition where you're adding them together and you can get a stronger and stronger field. And that's why I said, even the little tiniest magnets that we can make fit in your hand we can still generate you know, well over 45 Tesla and a small little demonstration coil, huge world record, what, two years ago maybe? So yes, size, size matters. Yeah, and, and Ernesto basically already explained the electromagnet, so that is awesome, and that we get the, the strongest field inside the coil. 
And um, that is also how we built our magnets at the magnet lab. And actually I brought um, some discs here um, from, from our, or yeah, that, that make part of our electromagnets. Um, actually, instead of having a, a wire wound, there you go, Carlos, we have stacks of these discs. So we stack those like a helix with some insulating material in between. So we built uh, our coils off of these um, and that's how we make our magnets. And um, I hope you can see this. There's actually lots of little holes in, uh, in these discs. And um, as we said, you know, lots of current um, will make a stronger field, but lots of current also produces a lot of heat. So that's actually what these holes are for is that we can pump lots of cooling water through these magnets so that we don't melt our magnet while we produce that magnetic field. There you go, Carlos has them. He even has two different designs. All right, so we said we, uh, we need this, uh, we need this um, uh, wire to uh, wind a coil and make an electromagnet. And uh, this picture really shows you all the pieces you need that, um, that you can build your own electromagnet at home. So I'll just give you that idea and show you how that works out and how an electromagnet can be used as a chunk yard magnet. So uh, you see the battery, you see the wire, you see the rod and the rod by itself doesn't really do a whole lot. But once we wind the coil and I did that there with a second set, See my friend picking up the paper clips with our uh, kitchen top junkyard magnet here. And uh, that is also something that uh, Carlos does in his classroom outreach. So uh, that might be something that you all may want to come back to with your school classes at some point. I'm going to reach over here and pull it out because I've got the same wire and the same rod by some amazing coincidence. Um, so I'll fold it up real closer if I can see how my wire is wrapped around my iron rod. And I'm going to take this opportunity, since I am speaking, to ask a question that just came into the um, um, chat box. First of all, they asked you to play the video again. I'm seeing so you're already doing that. Uh, but the question is, um, what is a helix? Oh, what is a helix? A helix is a, uh, a wound up structure. So um, um, I'm, I'm doing the, the spiral staircase um, here. So it's, uh, it's basically like a, a spiral staircase is what, what a helix looks like. Sorry, I should have said that, I apologize. No, you're fine. Um, yeah, the, the helix is that spiral. Um, in science, they also call it a solenoid, um, even though, and, and either one of you um, can correct me if I'm wrong, but a solenoid, is the twist that's used in an electromagnet. Is that right? Yes. The, yes, the twisting of the wire creates a solenoid, yes. Okay, so I wanted to use that point to show you all some electromagnets that we have at the mag lab. So once we have um, used all these disks and have built our, um, our helix or our coil, um, our spiral, um, you, can, uh, you can see what it looks like. It looks like this. And actually to make an even stronger field, we nest smaller ones uh, inside of bigger ones. So we have up to five coils one around one another and the field all ends up to make a really, really strong field at the center of it. Here, you can see one of our world record magnets that we commissioned uh, probably two or three years ago. It makes more than 40 Teslas. Then you can see that there's multiple of these inside of one another. And you can also see, here you see the, um, the hook of a crane, that the structure is pretty big. So um, there's no person here in the picture, but if I would be standing next to it and I'm about five foot four, I would only uh, come to maybe about this height. So um, in the picture on the right, there is a person uh, standing next to it. And this is if you look at the magnet from the top. So this is, um, this is this part in the top. So they are uh, pretty big structures. And also I wanted to point out that there's all these uh, pipes sticking out of it. Um, and that is where our cooling water comes in and out and that gets pressed 
through these little holes in the coils so that we don't overheat our magnets. All right, and that was permanent magnets. That was uh, electromagnets, but there is another group of magnets and they are called superconducting magnets. And uh, that's what we have our guest for. So I'll kick off with one question, but I'm hoping that you all will take over from there. Um, so questions about superconducting magnets, just type them in the chat box and Carlos is gonna help us pull them out. Um, so Ernesto, what in the world is a superconducting magnet? Oh, wow, Julia, that's a, that's a great question. It's um, rather complicated. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and answer it. Um, if you think of the electromagnet, the example you, you presented earlier is, is a perfect electromagnet. You have a wire, you make it into a coil, and you run electricity through it. Voila, electromagnet. A superconducting magnet, the only difference is you're, you're using a superconductor. Now, a really interesting and, and important distinction is that a superconductor needs two things. You need to cool it down. You need to get it very, very cold, cryogenically cold. Um, and once you do that, there's a critical temperature underneath which, below which, um, it no, is no longer resistive. Means is if you have current going through a normal wire, there's resistance. And the resistance turns into heat, joule heating. You mentioned that with the holes in the uh, bitter disk, right? We flow lots of water through that in order to keep the copper or whatever material from melting because that's how much electricity we're putting through it. A superconductor, once we get it cold enough, it doesn't heat up because there's no resistance. So now you can imagine that we can push a lot more electricity through smaller and smaller wires. And like we already discussed, with the more electricity you run through it, the stronger the magnetic field. So in a nutshell, that's a superconducting solenoid. So where's the catch? It almost sounds too good to be true. Oh, well, there are many catches. <laughs> so first and foremost, um, you have to get it cold. Right, so there's a there's a cryogenics aspect. Um, there's an energy uh, imbalance where you have to keep it cold. Then there are two other critical limits. Um, every superconductor only superconducts to some upper current, some critical current. So if you were to exceed that critical current, say you have a one millimeter wire, um, I can give you an example of a wire that can ha handle a thousand amps. That's a lot of current through a one millimeter wire. But if you were to go above that, let's imagine that's the critical current, it would immediately turn resistive. Now, what do you think happens to a resistive wire with a thousand amps running through it? It would immediately, right, it would get so hot, it would probably just melt immediately. The other limit is a critical field. So it can only survive inside of a magnetic field that's so high. So if you were to take this imaginary superconducting wire, you have it cold, you're not putting all that much electricity through it right close to the edge, and then you bring it inside of another magnetic field, well, that magnetic field is interacting with the electricity running through that wire, so it destroys the superconductivity, and again, it goes resistive, and again, you have problems. So there's the catch. It's, it's a nice little envelope that these materials can work in. And that's our job as the, uh, as the magnet designer is to get to that edge of operating ability and, and push the technology further and further and further. Wow. And also, you mentioned the number um, when you were talking about the current running through the wire. What was that number again? Oh, I just picked a random number of about a thousand amps. Um, that's you know, a number that you can imagine for, um, let's say, uh, a flat tape superconductor that we use a lot of called um, REPCO, rare earth bismuth copper oxide. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing there is I want to talk about the dimension of that wire. It's, it's a tape, okay? It's four millimeters wide and one micron thick, one millionth of a meter. One thousandth of a millimeter thick can carry a thousand amps. And that is now, 
crazy because, you know, I work on the resistive magnet side and, you know, we work with big copper bars. And for us, a rule of thumb is a thousand amps goes through a solid copper conductor that is an inch by an inch. So I need right. at room temperature an inch by an inch of solid copper to conduct that much electricity. Right. Now, now again, again, caveat, right? These thousand amps can only run if there isn't an external magnetic field, because as mm -hmm. soon as you, you, you have another magnetic field, that critical current starts to drop, right. right? And then there's another one, and that's the physical material can only tolerate so much strain, so much stress, because it itself, believe it or not, is a ceramic. <laughs> so it'll crack, it'll break, it's brittle. So it's, it's a very interesting fine line of, of usability. So that's the catch. But eh, once you take all those things into account, it's, it's pretty amazing material. Sketcher. Yeah, sure. Carla. I've got, I got questions. Um, actually, no, I don't got questions. They've got questions for you. Are you ready? Um, oh, I'll start with, yeah, I'll start with what, I, what I think is the easy one. Is it heavy? No. It's as heavy as a normal material you can imagine, right? Um, I will, I will say a magnet wound with the tape superconductor that I was just discussing, because you can put so much of it in such a small space, it gets dense. But you can think of it as the same, roughly the same weight of uh, a massive copper or something like that. All right, next question is a two-part question. First, are MRI and CAT scans superconducting? Ooh, good question. Um, I know that a lot of MRI magnets are superconducting. I'm not too familiar with CAT scans. I don't think they are. Oh, he's shaking his head, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, but yes, MRI magnets, uh, yes, are, are mm -hmm. typically superconducting. Um, and there's a whole field of, of how to get those cold and keep them cold. Which brings me to the second part of that question. And that um, they're asking, can you talk about how magnets are used in image scanners? Ooh, okay. Um, this is my understanding, not my expertise, but my understanding. Um, Julia showed a picture of a permanent magnet and she showed this, this, this material, right? And it had all kinds of um, domains inside, all kinds of regions and the electrons were all scattered around. And in a magnet, you tend to have everything pointing the same direction, right? So what an MRI magnet does is it aligns your electrons, right? Or at least some fraction of them. And then when it turns off, they reorient. reorient. And that reorientation is the image that you get, right? So that's typically, or my understanding of how they work. That's, that's all I got for right now. Okay. Um, all right. Um, do I need to reshare Carlos or do, uh, how does that work? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're free to share screen again. Okay, cool. Well, thanks a lot for all these questions to Ernesto and he's still hanging <laughs> out. So if any more questions are, uh, are coming up, um, put them in the chat box and, um, let's go to our hands-on experiment. So as we said, we need a fridge magnet and we need some paper clips. So um, you just have your metal paper clips here um, and your uh, fridge magnet. And um, Ernesto just alluded to it and we looked at it earlier. You know, we had this, um, we had this picture where, you know, we had all these little, um, uh, electron domains randomized um, inside the material. And that's basically what's going on in your paper clip. There's lots of um, electrons available uh, to, to act in, uh, as a magnet, but they, they just have to be convinced to do so. And um, to align them and convince them that they wanna work as, um, as a magnet, we have to do is we have to align them. So we have to all make them point the same direction. And this experiment that we're showing you and that we ask you all to try out at home um, does exactly that. So let's check it out. So here's our paper clips, they're ordinary paper clips. So if you touch one with the other, nothing happens. 
And here you can see um, how you can magnetize the paper clip. So you move with the same part of the magnet over the paper clip. I would do it at least 30 to 50 times. And it's important that you don't rub back and forth, just do like a circular motion, always go the same direction um, and turn your paper clip into a magnet so that now when you pick up the second paper clip, uh, you have actually produced a little magnet there. So what I would like to um, challenge you all to do is magnetize paper clips and make a paper clip chain at home. So try out how many paper clips you can magnetize and hang together as a string of paper clips. And we ask you all to send us a picture of your experiment by Monday morning, March the 1st at eight o'clock and you can enter for a chance to win a cool prize. And some of the prizes will be some of our cool bitter magnet discs. So send us your picture of your experiment and tell us how it went, tell us what you observed. You can email us at sciencelight at magnet.fsu.edu and I'll ask Carlos if he can also share the email address in the chat maybe. I already uh, did, thanks Yulia. Awesome, thank you. Our chat master is just too good for us. So, um, so I suggest that you all try that and please let us know how it goes. Uh, we always love the pictures that you guys send us from the experiments. That is so fun and um, we're, uh, we're looking forward to receive those. All right, and that brings us to um, Casey's library books. Casey, take it away. Hi guys, I'm back. I was just working on making my um, my magnetic paper clips here. So if you like that experiment, we also have other uh, books that you can check out from your local library. These are from the Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library System. So this is What Makes Magnet, What Makes a Magnet by Franklin and Brandley. So this goes back and um, talks about or reviews some of the things that Miss Yulia and Mr. Ernesto and Mr. Carlos talked about tonight. If you want to get a little bit more in depth and do a few more um, experiments, we have this awesome magnet power that takes you through some fun experiments with magnets. And last but not least, I have a wonderful magic school bus book called Amazing Magnetism where Miss Frizzle goes on a magnetic adventure. So this is for the little older ones. I also saw that Preston wanted a shout out. So shout out to Preston. Hey, all right. And you can pick these up at Leroy, Leroy Collins Leon County Public Library System. There's also a long, or, um, a list of extra materials there if you wanna check out those uh, or your local library, wherever your local library is. Thanks guys. Thank you, Ms. Casey. And Ms. Casey's book list is linked to our website. So if you go to our website, if you don't know where our website is, uh, it's nationalmaglab.org. Or if you Google Maglab Science Night, you have a pretty high chance that your first hit will take us to, will take you to our uh, website. And we always link Ms. Casey's book list uh, right here with the Science Night and all of that stays up. And also the video of tonight's event will come to our website uh, shortly. Um, that brings me to wrapping up. I would like to thank everyone that contributed tonight, Ms. Casey, our librarian, Carlos, our awesome chat master, and Ernesto from the Super Connecting Center to uh, share his expertise with us. Thank you all for joining us tonight and we hope to see you on March 25th when our topic will be electricity. So um, that is a very similar topic and always fun to check out and um, we'll have an engineer with us as well to uh, help us unravel some of the mysteries there. Also, I wanted to point out that um, it is the virtual MagLab open house. 
So um, already ongoing and still for a couple of days, lots of virtual events. There is something for everybody. So please check out our uh, virtual open house. And um, with that, I pass to Carlos for our closing remarks. Just want to remind everyone that the National Mag Lab is supported by taxpayer funding. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for supporting our science. We're made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida. So uh, last thing I want to say to everybody, as always, stay nerdy, stay geeky, and stay true to who you are. So on behalf of Godzilla and I am Groot, I am Groot. Thank you Goodbye, all. everyone. <laughs>